recording for this meeting has begun. Hello, everyone. On behalf of Feed the Future and the USA Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I welcome you to our webinar, Supporting the Management of Fall Armyworm in Africa and Asia, Best Practices and Lessons Learned. My name is Zachary Bake, Knowledge Management Advisor with the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and today's webinar host. I will facilitate today's webinar so you'll hear my voice periodically, see my video occasionally, uh, especially during our question and answer session. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself, ask questions, and share resources. We really appreciate it. So this helps to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and you know, helps us to learn even more than uh, as we go along. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end and try to address as many as possible. Uh, we'll also be providing the slides and make those available for download. And we will also be, at the end of this webinar, having the recording and other resources available to you to be, uh, that will be mailed to you, have you registered once you've read, as for those who have registered for the event. Uh, they will also be available up on AgriLinks on the event page. Uh, as I noted lastly, we are recording the web this webinar and uh, we'll post those resources. Okay, so onwards to our presentations and discussions on supporting the management of fall armyworm in Africa and Asia, best practices and lessons learned. With that, let me welcome Rob Bertram, Chief Scientist in USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. He serves as a key advisor on a range of technical and program issues to advance global food security and nutrition. In this role, he leads USAID's evidence-based efforts to advance research technology and implementation uh, in support of the U.S. government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative, Feed the Future. He previously served as director of the Office of Agriculture, Research, and Policy in the Bureau for Food Security. Prior to that, he guided USAID investments in agriculture and natural resources research for many years. Dr. Bertram's academic background in plant breeding and genetics includes degrees from University of California, Davis, University of Minnesota, and the University of Maryland. Dr. Bertram will introduce the session and the speakers. I hand it over to you, Rob. Thanks, Zachary, and uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Hoping we have a global audience here, so I won't say good morning because I could be any time of day. Um, thanks uh, to all the organizers and our, our at um, the KDLT for uh, helping us convene this AgriLink session. Um, this is a bit of a continuing saga. This is the most recent chapter of something that happened uh, started about four years ago when uh, fall armyworm, which is native to the Americas. Uh, somehow got to Africa. Um, and uh, since then, it has spread across the world, uh, even having reached Australia. There are very few places now where this pest is not found. Um, and uh, the response to this has been uh, a, a, a whole range of efforts, but especially a partnership that uh, USAID uh, began alongside our colleagues at USDA, State Department, and others to, to take the learning, essentially, that we had from the Americas and rapidly engage with partners across the world in the Americas where the pest was well known, but also in Africa and Asia where it was uh, causing uh, huge losses. Um, in uh, 2018, for example, there were estimates that up to 17 million tons of maize could be lost uh, due to the fall armyworm which is enough maize to feed or help feed tens of millions of people. And of course, the, the, the terrible thing about this pest is that it, like, like locusts, it hits uh, smallholders very hard, uh, less resource endowed farmers where maize is a critical uh, aspect of food security. Its impacts, as we know, are not limited to maize. It, it, it is, uh, will attack a number of different uh, crop species but maize is its favorite, along with uh, sorghum, for example. But, but um, unlike the locust situation, which, of course, we're also dealing with right now in the world, this is a threat that's much more diffuse. Um, it, it doesn't lend itself to a big centralized approach. And hence, the knowledge piece 
and the local understanding that, of how to how to um, manage, uh, uh, track, and and respond to this pest is is really where the action is. So this partnership that um, began uh, several years ago has involved partners from around the world, and we're going to have the pleasure of hearing from some of the key players in this space who have worked so hard and so quickly to, to uh, stand up, uh, share learning, and uh, put in place evidence-based approaches for managing this pest through a number of strategic entry points. The other thing I want to just say in, in opening is that it's great to see our friends at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations uh, stand up very recently what's called a global action on fall armyworm. And again, this is about trying to move beyond um, a set of working groups, tech, technical working groups that FAO set up uh, some years ago, uh, and move it towards something that is more unified, more strategic, and more likely to um, dis aggregate, disseminate, and, and engender broad response across the whole sets of regions that are being impacted by this pest. So I'm delighted that, that that has come up, and I think the basis for a lot of that work is coming out of the partnerships that came out of the Fall Army Worm Task Force uh, set up several years ago by our, by our then administrator, Mark Green. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, turn now to our, uh, our speaker, and our first speaker today is uh, Joe uh, uh, Husing. Joe is uh, an entomologist by training. He worked for years with us here in USAID, um, and he's continuing as a strategic advisor, including to the fall armyworm, um, the uh, R4D, Research for Development, which we're going to be hearing more about. That was another partnership set up in uh, a couple of years ago to globally link together the research partners and provide the evidence base. And Joe's been a very active partner throughout. So thanks, Joe, for all you've contributed, and over to you. Yay. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, what I'm going to do is just briefly recap some of the lessons learned from the Fall Armyworm campaign uh, to help set the stage for the subsequent speakers so that we all have a, a common framework. Uh, the Fall Armyworm was first published on in 2016 uh, from researchers from IITA in West Africa, although it's likely the pest was uh, on the continent sometime earlier. A number of farmers we speak to across the continent suggest uh, 2014 or, or perhaps even earlier. Importantly, work from the USDA, and this is primarily Rob Nagoshi and, and Rob Mahar, uh, suggests that the biotype of the fall army worm that was introduced into Africa comes from the South Florida Caribbean region. We don't know precisely when, where, or how many times an introduction occurred into Africa, but this piece of information is crucial because it suggests that there was an extreme genetic bottleneck that occurred when a small number of these moths were, were entered into the continent. Uh, that's important because currently we don't have any evidence that any of the Bt resistance alleles transferred with that population, but we also don't have any data to firmly confirm that, so that's an ongoing piece of work. Uh, and then secondly, we don't know the status of any of the pesticide resistance alleles that the population may be carrying. Uh, currently, it's believed that the populations that are spreading across Asia were derived from this single uh, founder population in Africa. Uh, finally, it does appear that it is primarily the maize strain, uh, perhaps with some hybridization before entry, uh, that uh, was was um, that arrived in Africa, and which explains why the predominant species of plants that are attacked are maize and sorghum. 
As many of you know, the uh, fall armyworm does not have the capacity to die a pause, but is endemic in much of the tropical Americas. Now, this is essentially from southern Brazil uh, to south Florida. That same situation will occur across uh, much of Asia, and that's what we're seeing now, where the challenge will be to control this pest in an area where there are multiple overlapping generations of the pest. What can we expect? Getting good assessment data on impacts of insects in maize are difficult. In general, low-resource farmers don't weigh their maize yields at the end of the season. Uh, and at best, some may take a volumetric measure of yield. So in the Americas, farmers generally know the impact of a pest on their crop uh, because the material is weighed at harvest. Farmers keep records, and they can roughly assign cause and effect to yield losses from year to year. We don't have those kinds of data in much of the developing world. And so the assessments for losses due to the fall army worm uh, are derived mainly from farmer surveys. Uh, but you can see how complex this uh, equation is because the uh, damage loss is a function of the maize variety. And Prasanna is going to talk to you a lot about differences in response to different maize varieties, the agronomic practices that farmers use, whether they fertilize or adjust soil pH, and the stage of the maize that's attacked. The different stages of maize are more susceptible to fall army worm attack. The intensity is important. Whether the percentage is high or low uh, within a field is an important characteristic to assess damage. And then the number of generations of fall army worm. It's possible in, in a 120-day maze, for example, to have three or four generations attack that maze. What we can say are researchers like the Gruden co-workers working in Kenya uh, as well as Ethiopia using farmer surveys suggest that somewhere on the order of 50, 40 to 50 percent of the maize has been lost to fall armyworm each year. GM trials, genetically modified maize that are ongoing in, in countries like Kenya where identical uh, varieties of maize are compared side by side with the only difference and in the, in the resistant variety carrying a, a resistance gene to the fall army worm suggests that the maize losses are on the order of 35%. Um, Bob and Dreer and co-workers just published a very nice paper. Uh, they have a lot of yield data. And if the, the yield loss data weren't summarized, per se, I didn't have time to go through those. But they can show with an insecticide trial using emamectin benzoate, which is very effective at controlling fall army worm, that they can more than double yields with control from that material. Uh, Prasanna and others have shown that in uh, similar sorts of trials where insecticides were applied as a control measure, um, yield savings could be somewhere between, uh, say, 35 and, and almost 60 percent. So overall, I think the data suggests pretty strongly, depending on where they come from, that yield losses of around 10 to 50 percent due to this pest are not unreasonable. Fall army worm, like other pests, is best controlled within an integrated pest management framework. That framework is typically uh, illustrated by use of a triangle in which the pillars of integrated pest management, host plant resistance, conservation biocontrol, and pesticides when needed are, are shown on the corners of the triangle. Uh, IPM assumes that farmers use some level of good agricultural practices or cultural controls, things like soil health, fertilizer, soil pH, and planting date. It's important to remember that the key protection goal for a farmer is maize grain. The key technology to put in place for control of the pests like fall armyworm is host plant resistance. And Prasanna is going to talk to you about that in just a moment. If the proper cultural controls are put into place, the weather cooperates, a, a proper, nice, resistant maize variety is used, that generally leads to conservation biocontrol, which should suppress pest populations below economic injury. If a farmer checks their field, they scout its field, 
and they find that has not happened, they may have to resort to pesticide treatment of some sort. And for the small resource farmer, this would be a safer use pesticide that can be applied uh, safely with minimal PPE. This is a, a subject that Paul Jepson is going to talk about in detail. And, and then Dan McGrath will also talk about scouting procedures to address different clientele uh, within this landscape. The framework that we have put in place, the GAP IPM framework, is based on three central tenets, knowledge, tools, and policy. We have to teach farmers how to use good agricultural practices and integrated pest management. We have to provide them with safer use tools, such as safer use uh, pesticides, but this can only happen within a policy enabling environment. Um, the simple process of registering a pesticide for use against fall armyworm in most countries takes on the order of two years. So you can imagine a farmer has to wait two years once the fall armyworm uh, shows up to even have a chance of getting a, a pesticide registered for its use. And that's an area we're working on very actively. And, I, and I'm happy to say that the East uh, Africa community is well ahead of many stakeholders in this area in harmonizing pesticide regulation processes. At the end of the day, evaluating these, these tools is a function of the cost, the efficacy, the safety, the scalability, and the sustainability of the technology. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thank you very much for also for uh, sticking to time. And uh, since you did stick to time, we can take uh, one quick question, if, uh, if we have any, Zachary, from the audience uh, in terms of clarification. We will have 20 minutes at the end for further discussion. So I, uh, this is really more just if there's any clarifying questions for Joe. Thanks, Rob. Um, so we do have one clarifying question from uh, Washington Okino. Um, are there commercialized biocontrol agents that are in wide use in the Americas? Yes, there, there are commercially available uh, products for control of fall armyworm. Brazil, for example, uh, uses a biofactory type system uh, with trichogramma, the, uh, which is a, a parasitic wasp that attacks fall armyworm. And this is a good example of how to place the criteria, or how to use the criteria of cost, efficacy, scalability, and sustainability. Um, as best as I can tell, the cost of those treatments are probably something on the order of $150 per hectare. Uh, requiring something on the order of six treatments per season. So within the Brazil agricultural system, about 3% of the maize crop uh, is treated with what we would call augmentative biocontrol. Uh, so there, there are data that suggest that that approach works. Uh, but at, at present, it's quite expensive. And thus, uh, scaling that and sustaining it would be a challenge that a country, if they chose to, to use that approach, would have to address. Over. Rob, you, sound, you seem like you're on mute. Uh, do we have time Thank for another you. question? Sorry. Or? Sorry for that, Zachary. Uh, so I was saying thank you, Joe. Uh, thanks for the question and the excellent presentation. And I think the one of the key points that um, Joe has made is that fall armyworm is here to stay. In many areas, it's going to be endemic throughout the year. In some areas, it be, may be more migratory, as it is in parts of the United States, for example. But I think that's a great segue to our next speaker, and that is uh, uh, Professor Emeritus Dan McGrath. And Dan. Um, has uh, comes from Oregon State University and worked uh, for decades in Oregon's Willamette Valley, um, and he worked on vegetable production, vegetable production, integrated pest management, and sustainable agriculture. And since he retired I I a few years ago, he's been very active in this global effort to control and combat fall army work, fall army worm across uh, sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. So Dan is somebody who's taken 
years of experience with this pest and integrated pest management and is working with partners in Africa and Asia now. And he's worked, for example, uh, in a number of, with a number of USAID missions in Ghana, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh to train farmers how to scout fields, how to really manage the press, pest, and take the proper IPM steps to, uh, uh, in ways that actually match with the farmer's needs and experience. So, Dan, over to you, and thanks so much for joining us today. Dan, you might be on mute. Thank you for having me. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, monitoring and scouting, but I'm going to be specifically focusing on three uh, areas, high versus low density monitoring systems, scouting as an educational platform for multiple level audiences, and efficacy testing. When fall armyworm first arrives in a country, governments invariably establish large, complex, expensive monitoring systems with hundreds of monitoring sites. And the purpose of the high-density systems include early detection or detecting the arrival of fall armyworm. And these serve as the basis for pest alerts for farmers, tracking the spread and deploying resources, tracking the spread of fall armyworm and engaging the farming community in surveillance using phones, for example, to report what they find. But the overall focus is trying to prevent the establishment of fall armyworm. Now, the monitoring sites serve as very effective uh, monitoring, uh, I mean, educational platforms. But after about three to four months, farmers get tired of pest alerts. They need more information than just the presence or absence of fall armyworm. What they need is the, what they need to know is the level of pest pressure. What is what is the egg laying pressure? Is it high? Is it low? USAID in uh, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh successfully tested an alternative monitoring system using low density a low density approach. The purpose of the alternative system was different. The purpose was to detect and report variation in egg laying pressure, to provide decision support to farmers, not only with regards to high egg laying pressure, but also low egg laying pressure, and to promote farmer focus on biological and cultural controls and reduce pesticide use when egg laying pressure is low. Now, this is a data set from uh, Br the Brangahafo region of Ghana in West Africa. The vertical axis is the average moths per trap per day over time on the horizontal axis from April, May, June, and July. So this line are moth counts, average moth counts across the entire region. And this represents egg laying pressure. And in summary, I would say that the, the, the maize during this uh, production year that tasseled during the peak in egg laying pressure had between 50 and 75 percent cob damage, whereas the maize that tasseled in this low pressure period had essentially no cob damage. This data was generated with just 10 monitoring sites across about 40,000 square kilometers. So, Low-density monitoring systems are cost-effective, and they go beyond test alerts. Low-density monitoring systems support farmers, especially when they are trying to reduce pesticide use without putting their crop at risk when egg leg pressure is low. So let's talk about, let's talk about scouting. Scouting schools are, are an effective teaching method for multiple audiences, smallholders, lead farmers, and agricultural professionals. If we focus for the moment on smallholders, we all know that, that many of them are not going to go home and start formally scouting their fields. But the scouting field schools are a tremendous way to convey key concepts in fall armyworm management. For example, what do farmers need to know? Well, just because you have fall armyworm does not necessarily mean that you need to spray. 
farmers have a tendency to focus on mature plants, the big plants, and the dramatic damage symptoms caused by fall armyworm feeding in the world. In scouting school, um, we, they learn that the critical times to pay attention are at the seedling stage and at early cob development. Damage to the seedlings and damage to the young cobs is where your biggest impact from fall armyworm feeding comes from. Now, when the tassel, or, or so, so what do farmers need to know? They need to check your seedlings, con control small larvae before they move into the world. Now, when the tassel comes, it pushes the larvae out of the world. Where do they go? Well, they go to the base of the cobs. What do farmers need to know? Check during early cob development and control larvae before they penetrate the husk. Now, agricultural professionals are open to additional messages because they're not only focused on protecting the crop, but they're very concerned about controlling the cost, the overall cost of fall armyworm management. In order to manage uh, or, or reduce uh, pesticide use without putting the crop at risk, one needs to do an accurate job of risk assessment. It's necessary to take into account not only the density of the larvae, but also the size of the larvae, the plant growth stage, and weather conditions. An experienced scout should take, well, well all they need to scout a field is a piece of paper and adult pencil. And an experienced scout should take about no more than 15 minutes to scout a hectare of maize. In some cases, monitoring and scouting have reduced pesticide use by 40% or more. And monitoring and scouting are central to the integration of biological, cultural, and chemical control. Touching briefly on efficacy testing, it's important to recognize that with the fall armyworm, the plant-insect interaction is complex. It's easy to produce misleading results when testing the efficacy of materials and methods. We strongly encourage pesticide regulatory staff and researchers to monitor egg-laying pressure with a pheromone trap and use a scouting protocol when conducting efficacy tests. It's important to track not only plant damage, but also egg-laying pressure, the plant growth stage, and the larval size, which determines the vulnerability of the larvae to the materials and method. Key results to date include the widespread utilization of the IPM manual for the training of trainers across Africa and Asia. And there's good evidence that many of the key messages associated with the scouting schools are reaching smallholder farmers. In terms of next steps and what is needed today, we need to help the USAID missions to deploy the revised fall armyworm manual, which will be coming out shortly, in order for the next level of training for the multiple audiences in scouting and monitoring. And we need to help, USAID needs to help Africa and Asian countries to transition to more cost-effective, low-density monitoring systems that focus on supporting farmers especially when farmers are trying to reduce pesticide use. And with that, I yield my time to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. That was a really helpful presentation. And um, I think one of the things that uh, you reminded us about is this critical issue of getting the pest at the right time and also, I think this relates back to the aflatoxin issue and the food safety issue in terms of the, the cob stage. And this is something, again, that's such an insidious impact associated with fall armyworm. But also, those very small larvae very early on, when the, the damage isn't really very visible, is also critical. And of course, once they're in the world, they're a lot less vulnerable. So now we're going to move. Well, before we move on, let's take time for uh, one question. Zachary, do we have any questions? Yes, Rob, we've got uh, quite a few rolling in. Um, one quick one from Justice uh, Frimpong. 
uh, currently is looking into nitrogen fertilization on maize growth uh, and development linked to fall armyworm damage. Will this help the maize to recover from the attack? Those of you who were, who were with us in Hyderabad, India, had an opportunity to look at one variety of maize which was heavily infested with fall armyworm. And, and four rows were, had an adequate fertilizer program, and four rows had an inadequate fertilizer program. And the, and the difference was very dramatic. Uh, the, the, the robustness with which the plant is growing makes a huge difference in its ability to recover, even from fairly high levels of, of fall armyworm damage. I would warn you that, 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 that fertility does not have an impact on the susceptibility of the cobs to fall armyworm damage. So it's important to check not only at the seedling stage, but also at the early cob development stage. Over. Great. Thanks for that question and for that uh, great answer, Dan. And I think it just underscores, double underlines this issue of good agricultural practices in so many of the contexts in which we're we're trying to work and, and farmers are trying to, to make their living and, and feed their communities. So now we're going to move on to a more of a, a um, sort of unpack some of the tools that uh, both Joe and Dan have talked about today. And we're going to start with Dr. Uh, Bodapali Prasanna. Uh, Dr. Prasanna is, he's unfortunately somebody who I have on speed dial on my phone, so I'm constantly turning to him for help and advice. But today, uh, he's going to help us all by uh, providing some real insights into the roles of, especially of host plant resistance, which is one of the areas under the R4D uh, uh, task force in which uh, Simit and Dr. Persana personally have been leading. And so, uh, Dr. Persana, thank you so much for all your contributing, and, and uh, we're, we're, we're really interested to hear uh, from you about uh, the progress being made in combating uh, fall armyworm and using this critical tool. Thank you. Uh, many thanks, uh, Rob, for this uh, uh, a kind introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to interact with you, uh, no matter what time or what day it is. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the topic that I'm going to focus on is uh, the host plant resistance to fall armyworm management. Uh, this is the work that is done by a very dedicated uh, group of researchers at CIMIT. Uh, I would just name a few like Yosef Dean, Dan Mukundi, uh, Anani Bruce. Uh, all these guys have tremendously contributed to what I am going to present here. This, uh, this work has been uh, collectively funded by a number of agencies. USAID is the key agency here. And apart from that, there is a CGR research program on maize, uh, which has largely contributed to the work. Uh, so as uh, Joe Huising uh, uh, pointed out, uh, host plant resistance is a very, very important component of the integrated pest management approach towards uh, uh, controlling many insect pests, including uh, the fall armyworm. But breeding for resistance in maize uh, at CIMIT to these insect pests is uh, not uh, five years or 10 years old, but almost now four decades old. A series of publications came out in 1990s on uh, breeding for resistance to insect pests such as stem borers, as well as fall armyworm. Uh, one of the most notable land races uh, that contributed tremendously to these efforts are the Cuban slings, uh, besides the Tuxpeno uh, maize. So both of them, one coming from Cuba uh, and another land race uh, collection coming from uh, Mexico, both of them have very, very significantly contributed to CIMIT's efforts on developing uh, germplasm with resistance to insect pests. Uh, the source germplasm uh, of our insect resistance uh, is, is, has been happening since many decades. Uh, the person which I've showed in this photograph here is John John Mim. John Mim unfortunately passed away a few years back, uh, but in the, in the work that he has done in 1980s and 90s has led to uh, a collection of germplasm that has been used not only by CIMIT, but also by researchers at USDA, ARS at Mississippi, at uh, universities in the US. So John, in 1984, in one of the articles, he says, uh, we concentrate on attempting to identify and use more stable resistance to larval feeding. 
of the antibiotics, strong non-preference, or plant tolerance mechanisms in order of priority and as expressed in a no-choice situation under field conditions. Uh, that, in fact, remains the guiding principle uh, in our efforts to screen large collections of germplasm and uh, pest growth in Africa and further in Asia. Uh, CIMIT, with support from USAID and CRP maize, established uh, a screen house complex. Uh, what you see here are around seven such screen houses, each almost three fourths of an acre size, but we have around 13 such screen houses at uh, Kibako uh, in our partner, uh, Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization, Kalro uh, Center at, at Kibako. Uh, similar, uh, uh, what we call facilities, we are planning to establish at Harare uh, and also in Asia. So using this complex, we have screened around 3,124 inbred lines and more than 3,200 hybrids, three commercial hybrids against fall amoebam under artificial infestation. Uh, that means after mass raining of the fall amoebam larvae, then identified and validated those promising fall amoebam tolerant inbred lines, whether they came from Latin America or from the African germplasm, and then disseminated some of the key cement maze lines. These are elite uh, inbred lines, including CML 71, 125, 330, 338, 370, 574, uh, these are some very, very good CMLs if you really wish to strengthen your breeding for resistance to fall amoeba. Uh, a number of partners, public sector partners in Africa as well as Asia, uh, have received these CML sets uh, from CIMIT. Uh, more importantly, uh, our germplasm screening efforts do not just limit to foliar damage ratings. Foliar damage has to be certainly less than or equal to five on a one to nine scale, uh, but the ear damage, which is also very, very important, has to be has to be not more than three on a one to nine score. Uh, this is as Rob pointed out, the higher the ear damage, the greater are the opportunities for aflatoxin producing fungi or mycotoxin producing fungi to affect those ears and make them uh, vulnerable to a uh, number of issues. Grain yield also under fall amoebam artificial infestation is also equally important, not just uh, foliar damage rating or ear damage rating, how much yield do you get? And what are the other relevant traits that are present in the genetic backgrounds of these varieties? Uh, a farmer is not going to grow a fall amoebam tolerant variety, which is highly vulnerable to drought or to some other disease. So when we do breeding for resistance, it's not just uh, a overnight job, we have to make sure that these varieties combine all the relevant traits that are needed by the smallholder farmers. But as you can see in these photographs, uh, some of our fall amoebam tolerant three commercial hybrids are showing excellent response. Uh, these are as good as you can see here, uh, with the vulnerable varieties showing a lot of damage, foliar damage, as well as ear damage, and the tolerant hybrids showing much, much lesser uh, damage uh, at both the stages. Uh, so CIMIT's uh, ongoing on-station and on-farm validation trials are multiple. We are, we are now presently screening eight very promising fall amoebom tolerant pre-commercial hybrids along with four carefully selected susceptible commercial checks under different experiment. No choice experiment under fall amoebom artificial infestation. On-station trials at, uh, at, at six at six different sites under natural infestation. And then there are on-farm trials at around 16 sites in Kenya under fall amoebom natural infestation, but under farmer management conditions. So the data, once they are available to us, in the last quarter of this year, there'll be a stage gate advancement process and we'll be in a position to release uh, to our partners the first generation fall amoebom tolerant uh, hybrids from CIMIT. So that's uh, the uh, most important news here. So there is a plenty of opportunity uh, to get varieties that have excellent resistance to uh, fall amoebam with much lesser foliar damage or even ear damage and good grain yields. Again, this is another experiment that is ongoing at uh, a place called Tunyaga in Kenya, a fall amoebam on farm validation trial. Again, you can see an excellent uh, hybrid, tolerant hybrid 
compared to one of our very popular com uh, commercial hybrids released through simid germplasm, but again showing high vulnerability uh, to phalami one. So the native genetic resistance, what are the next steps? Similar to the MLM success story, uh, we would like to accelerate the development of elite maize varieties with climate resilience and phalami one tolerance in diverse genetic backgrounds relevant for Africa as well as Asia. And uh, the work that is going on right now on Fala Miwam, the genomic regions for Fala Miwam uh, resistance in maize, uh, we'll be validating them. We'll be first of all identifying discovery, validation, and deployment. Uh, those stages have to pass before we uh, routinely use genomics assisted breeding. We also need to channelize extensive public private partnerships for deploying those elite Fala Miwam tolerant uh, varieties with a faster varietal turnover and demonstrate the benefits of integrating native genetic resistance with other IPM tactics, especially the gap IPM uh, that was highlighted by Joe Huising and the biological control uh, similar to the approaches taken in some of the countries. Uh, the BG maize, uh, let's uh, uh, remember, is another most important tool in the IPM toolbox. Uh, there are numerous GM maize hybrids uh, including various combinations of cry and the vegetative insecticidal protein genes that are commercially available in Brazil as well as North America. These are deployed so widely and US and Brazil retain their advantage in terms of not only meeting their domestic needs but also in a position to export uh, maize to different parts of the world. Um, and that's really important. Fala Mivam has been there for several decades in these uh, uh, countries, but uh, uh, US and Brazil have kept up their advantage. Insect resistance management and product stewardship are indeed extremely important for GM maize to be sustainable and continue to be effective uh, in farm management. And uh, those, those are important principles irrespective of where, where you grow uh, GM maize. Uh, BT maize in Africa, uh, what is the status? Monate 9034, an important BT event, uh, is presently uh, showing high levels of fall on Iwam control in South Africa, demonstrated through our project, uh, a project led by African Agriculture Technology Foundation, and uh, they are uh, donating these, these transgenes uh, for the benefit of uh, smallholders in Africa. Uh, similarly, Monate 10, although not purposefully designed for fall on Iwam control, uh, the confined field trials in Kela project target countries in Africa is showing partial but significant control under Palamivam natural infestation versus the commercial susceptible checks. So CIMIT has contributed to this project by, uh, by providing as many as 49 unique lines uh, so far under Kela project for BT tracing projects, uh, especially Monet 10 and 29 with 89034. BT maize is also being grown in Asia. Uh, almost 630,000 hectares in Philippines and almost 50,000 hectares in Vietnam. And uh, there is also VIP3A uh, MIV-60-162 uh, that is uh, either alone or stacked with those uh, uh, events. So Asia, some countries are progressing strongly in terms of uh, BT maize deployment. And there is opportunity for other countries also perhaps to uh, regulate some of these events. My final slide, so we need to remember that BT-based resistance and native genetic resistance could be quite complementary. They are not exclusive. And you can successfully stack the BT events in an excellent drought-tolerant, MLN-resistant, and fall on ebomb tolerant genetic backgrounds. And that could be a much more sustainable and durable way of uh, fall on ebomb management for the future. Uh, I thank the partners in Africa and Asia, uh, USAID in particular, USDA, uh, for providing tremendous support for this uh, uh, initiative. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Prasanna, for that really great overview. Uh, I think we're I think we, we're not going to take time for a specific question now, but we can for, for people who have those, Let's please bring them back. Uh, we'll bring them back during the, the broader discussion a little later on. I want to just flag a couple of things that, from your presentation, Dr. Prasanna. Uh, one is 
how important it is to be able to use genetic resources from around the world, in this case from the Caribbean and Mexico, to address the needs of farmers in Africa and Asia. This is really exciting. And it's why it's so important that we continue to find ways to globally utilize and make these genetic, incredibly important genetic resources available to the needs of all of the farmers in the developing world and worldwide for that matter. Second uh, point is just the importance of seeing the research in the farmers' fields too, Dr. Pisana. I want to congratulate you for that. Um, so I think we, uh, we're going to move on now to a situation where you know, we can use host plant resistance either BT or classical resistance, as Dr. Prezana has uh, discussed, but there are also situations where we need to come in with more specific controls. And uh, I'm delighted to say that we have uh, Paul Jepson, who is, uh, again, from Oregon State University, where, as you see, he leads the uh, direct the uh, Integrated Plant Protection Center. And Paul uh, similarly has been, like Dan, uh, very, very involved with uh, this global effort. Um, he's serving with uh, the FAO Technical Working Group and on the Technical Committee of the Global Action that I mentioned earlier. And Paul is uh, a leader in this issue of how non-target species are affected. So he approaches the pesticide issue and, as, and the tool as, as, as using it smart, in a smart way, as, as Joe mentioned in his first presentation. So, uh, Paul, w welcome and over to you. Thank you very much, Rob. And can you hear me? Yes, you hear you loud and clear. We can hear you. Well, good morning, everybody around the world. Um, yes, our project is addressing pesticides and fall armyworm, along with the many other people around the world, of course. My co-authors are Katie Murray, who's an anthropologist I work with at Oregon State University, uh, Mick Tateola from CRS in Malawi, who is incredibly helpful to us when we work there, and Max Star, FAO Senegal, with whom we're working on an application uh, manual, which I won't have time to talk about today, although that is a very important aspect of this problem. So I just wanted to capture the challenges because um, Unfortunately, with regard to fall armyworm, the marketplace has been rather flooded with broad spectrum and often highly hazardous pesticides. These are often inexpensive also, and we believe there's a high level of uptake by farmers. This not only is hazardous to farmers themselves, and public health and uh, the health impacts of this have not really been documented, and there's a, a seat at the table, unfortunately, still empty for that uh, me measuring health impacts of pesticides in this outbreak. However, there's also an ecological impact with large wide-scale suppression of natural enemies early in the season. And this inhibits the opportunity for IPM development and promotes pest outbreaks. We see this commonly here where pyrethroids are often pushed into marketplace early in the season. And it's almost conditions agriculture for very volatile high pest outbreak circumstances. So we see this progression from left to right of phase out of highly hazardous materials and high risk pesticides as being rather important if we're to build opportunities for IPM. Um, I've been involved in, in regimes such as this and outbreaks of this form, although not on this scale, but for a number of decades. And this is a common pattern that somehow uh, we would argue that we really need to do better and not rely on these mechanisms, which seem to have the opposite um, outcome to what we would wish in terms of promoting pest outbreaks. So working with uh, Katie Murray in uh, Malawi, our approach has been, and what I'm going to summarize today, is going to the farmers themselves to determine their need, characterizing local marketplaces, and then responding to those local needs and circumstances with targeted education. And so um, I will post at the end of my talk uh, open source links to the three articles I'm going to be talking about. Here with regard to um, pesticides and IPM in Malawi, farmers and extension agents were asking for much more information to support their decisions about pesticide selection and also much wider scale education about pesticide risk. But what we noted most was gaps in the continuity of information flow 
from researchers, even in centralized offices in Malawi, through extension to farmers, because there's no gas to put in the motorcycle tanks to get extension workers out to farmers. So there's multiple issues that need to be addressed, some of them very simple and not over expensive in order to get information flowing to the people that are making the, the decisions that are so critical. Um, work in Kenya, which has now been in the final stages of review, has revealed a very similar pattern of those slightly altered practices farmers are using. And so you can go to Katie's report, and this one will be published soon, to look at what farmers are employing against a wide array of pests and diseases in maize, not just against fall armyworm. But again, a lack of capacity to understand pesticides and how to apply them properly is something that's a major issue if we are to argue that pesticides have a role in fall armyworm management. So one thing we've been doing around the world is to ask uh, pesticide dealers to line up the chemicals farmers are buying and to tell us which ones they consider to be most efficacious. And this is just one of a number of dealers we visited in Malawi. And um, these pesticides include emamectin, besnabate, and avamectin, which have some challenges for smallholder farmers in health terms and some risk for natural enemies. But they also include delta mesrin and prophenophos, a very highly toxic organophosphate pesticide which is no longer used in the United States. My screen has frozen. I can't advance slides. Can you still hear me? Yes, you yes. can just let us know when you want to advance can your you slides. Can you advance to the next slide, please? I can't see. Has a new slide come up? My screen has frozen. Yes, it's the one that say these uh, profile. Okay, uh, um, so I'll ask you to describe the slide for me, and I'll uh, uh, just move on through the end of my presentation, okay? And then I think I'm locked out after that. Uh, so um, pesticide impacts on natural enemies are a thing I cannot deal with in detail here, but fall armyworm natural enemies are far more exposed to pesticides than fall armyworm is and care must be taken in when and what you are treating with. And using synthetic pyrethroids and agonophosphates is, is, agonophosphate pesticides is not compatible with IPM because you're eliminating natural enemies that are otherwise causing some pest limitation. Next slide, please. And I believe this shows a group of smallholder farmers in Malawi who were applying pesticides via a bucket and a brush dipped into the bucket. And again, the chemicals available to these farmers, they were reporting up to eight uses of synthetic pyrethroids a year and up to four uses of prophenophos. And around half to 60% of farmers reported using these pesticides. And prophenophos in particular was causing very severe health impacts to these farmers. And you can find this reported in Katie's report. And I'm gonna have to close out of the seminar and re-enter in a couple of minutes, and then I will post links to these reports um, when I, my talk is completed. Next slide, please, and can you tell me what this is? Hello? It's the risk yes, it has a, uh, it, it's a, um, a chart with uh, colored boxes. Okay. So one thing we have done is to take the 50 or 60 pesticides, and extremely disappointingly, I've never seen anything like this. We've filtered through the different chemicals available, going left to right in this figure, to isolate those that are low risk and appropriate for smallholder farmer use in the marketplace, and have efficacy against fall armyworm, which was already known and is being confirmed in much research that is now ongoing, and, and much of which is already being published. I find it incredibly disappointing that seven out of 56 pesticides that are on sale in Africa are actually um, appropriate for smallholder farmer use. And again, it's something that many of us on the call could address in our different systems and programs and networks to simply do better with. Next slide, please. And I believe this might show a set of publications. I'm trying to complete now, Rob, as quick as I can. That's fine. There's it does. A set of right. So one thing we've done is to publish our work in very high impact journals to subject it to high levels of, of peer review. 
and um, we have published a set of models and approaches to evaluating pesticide risks as well as efficacy in our latest article so that you can have a guide to pesticide selection that is not simply based upon lines of bottles on a, um, a shelf in a dealer's store. And so, again, uh, bearing in mind that protective clothing for farmers is not widely available, inaffordable, and unhealthy to use because of heat pressure, this should guide us to chemicals that are appropriate for smallholder farmer use. And there are low-risk materials that, that to, against which uh, fall armyworm is susceptible. Next slide, please. And I believe this shows a large table, correct me if it doesn't, but in the top right-hand corner of the table are those seven products. And this includes natural products that are sold as commercial pesticide formulations and can also be concocted by farmers. For example, neem is an extremely effective pesticide against fall armyworm. It includes one of the Bacillus thuringiensis um, species or subspecies, and um, also compounds such as chloramphaniliprole, which is a synthetic pesticide, but extremely effective against fall armyworm and not very toxic to natural enemies. So there are alternatives out there. Next slide, please. This is this removing, says removing barriers. barriers to IPM adoption. Yeah. So I just want to thank you, everybody, for listening. I'll leave the seminar and re-enter and try and post access to these articles. One thing we have done under USAID and USDA Foreign Ag Service sponsorship is to publish for the first time a rigorous scientifically based comparative summary of the risks and hazards posed by over 650 commonly available pesticides. So there is a basis in this work for you to select chemicals independently and to make use of this information in, in trying next time an invasive pest appears or during this present outbreak to select materials that are of low risk to farmers and natural enemies and other environmental compartments as well as offering some efficacy that you can determine with local trials and with our, our, our gathering experience. So thank you so much for listening, and um, I'm sorry about the small technical difficulties, but I don't think it's affected you too much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul, for that really great presentation. And I want to link together the last two presentations. Both of them underscored the importance of policy in terms of what is available for farmers and giving farmers the widest and best array of choices, be it around mm -hmm. seeds, uh, BT, or pesticides. And uh, working on uh, effective science-based regulatory uh, and efficient regulatory procedures is an important complement to the kinds of technolog technologies that we've just been hearing about from our speakers. So I'm not going to take a question because we're at time, but we will come back and hopefully, Paul, you'll be back in with us. And our next speaker who has just appeared is Sarah Page. And Sarah is going to round out this discussion today by bringing it all together at the level of how do you actually uh, uh, work in farmer context, in the context of fields, natural resource mm -hmm. management, markets and value chains. So Sarah is uh, the advisor, a technical advisor for sustainable livelihoods and landscapes at Catholic Relief Services. And Sarah, we're really delighted to have you come as sort of the integrator for all of the uh, uh, specific and um, sort of technical information we've had and how does this play out? I think you're gonna help us understand that. Over to you. All right, thank you, Rob. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Okay, great. So I'm going to dive into our case study, which focused on communication strategies and effects on fall armyworm management in Uganda. Um, the impetus for this study came from a concern that insufficient information was getting to different far farmer segments and from an interest in exploring two-way communication channels to disseminate information to farmers while also giving them a voice. And this was all in order to improve full armyworm response and the adoption of management practices among different stakeholders. So Uganda was chosen as a site for this case study in part because of the coordinated communications campaign implemented in that country, which was led by the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry, and Fisheries in coordination with the National Level Task Force. So our study had four main questions that looked at farmer access to information, 
the adoptive management practices, the results of those practices, and how farmers communicated back to the system. So we conducted the study. So we conducted the study in three districts of Uganda and employed a mixed methods approach to data collection. Respondents were then post categorized into wealth quartiles, and there was a negative correlation between gender and wealth, with more women um, being in the lower poor wealth quartiles. So for each of the main study questions, I'm going to quickly present some of the key results, and then I'm going to jump right into some of the conclusions and recommendations related to that topic, and then I'll summarize some of the main takeaways at the end. So first, how are farmers getting their information about fall armyworm? We saw that there was a relationship between wealth and gender and information access. So poor farmers and women access fewer information sources, and most were really relying on secondhand information through their social networks. Um, farmers groups were the preferred source of information because of accessibility and the perceived trustworthiness of that information. So groups allowed people to collectively validate what they're hearing. And the information source tended to differ somewhat depending on the aspect of full armory worm control. So for example, extension workers, agro dealers, and radio were, um, we saw were more widely used for accessing information about synthetic pesticides more so the, than for other non-chemical control measures. And also with the exception of radio, we saw that there was limited use of ICTs, especially by poorer farmers, which relates to a lack of ownership of devices that would then facilitate access to those channels. So based on those results, how can we then better facilitate access to information across different farmer segments? ICTs offer great potential to build awareness of a technology or a pet pest, but should be used as a complement, not necessarily a central feature. And although ownership of basic cell phones and even smartphones is growing, there's still a large percentage of farmers who don't have access to those devices. Therefore, there's a need to identify ICT connectors, such as youth or lead farmers who have access to technologies and could bridge that digital divide and also cross language barriers. And we know that there is a lot of good work being done in this space, but the, da the data suggests that more, more could be done. And if groups are a central platform to access information, we need to ensure that those groups are both inclusive of women and poor farmers. And I'll talk a little bit later how those groups could look differently to better facilitate information sharing, innovation, and feedback. So next, what practices were farmers implementing and what were the results of those practices? So the information campaign was effective in changing farmer behaviors. As an example, the majority of farmers we spoke with were using chemical pesticides to control fall armyworm, which is a departure for common, from common maize production practices previously. There was also a slight reduction in maize yield loss following the campaign. However, yields did not bounce back to pre-fall armyworm levels, and there could be many factors contributing to this, such as a steep learning curve associated with the use of pesticides, the need to continue to focus on good agricultural practices, and then also some of those issues with assessing yields um, that um, Joe mentioned earlier on. And poor farmers were more likely to adopt practices or follow guidelines that are not cash dependent, such as targeted pesticide application and spraying at the correct time of day versus those aspects of control that did require a cash input. And this suggests that costs for different fall and almond worm control practices can be prohibitive for some farmers. And we also saw evidence of misuse of synthetic pesticides. We also found that farmers, especially poor farmers, are still perceiving fall army worm as a threat. And this is likely linked to an inability to save for the purchase of pesticides, which um, with the farmers that we spoke with was really viewed as the main or the most effective control measure. So, so how can we support farmers to improve management of fall armyworm? There's wide variation in use of chemical pesticides, which suggests that much more work needs to be done to support the ability of service providers to give better, more specific information. And that can be a really complicated message. We'll need different ways of getting 
that information to farmers and need to think about how best to layer or sequence that information. An information campaign should be designed to better reflect the diversity of context and respond to farmer segments, and when possible, offer different tailored approaches or, or different sets of messages, uh, depending on different skill levels and economic levels. And Dan, in his talk, mentioned a perfect example related to layering information about scouting depending on the audience. And we should also help farmers to better understand the full economic cost of adopting or not adopting different management practices. And this requires helping to understand the expected um, costs and returns and requires a certain level of financial education. Um, it looks like I can't see the presentation, so please let me know if it's continuing and, and um, please advance to the next slide. Yeah, I'm not seeing your slide at this point, Sarah. Something, uh, I'm not sure what happened. Okay. Uh, yes, we're restoring it to the proper back. size. Somebody it's touched the chat pod. Okay, so, how, so lastly, how are farmers providing feedback? We saw that farmers are actively experimenting, but there's little documentation or co-validation of those practices. And learning and feedback cycles were somewhat weak. There was some, but limited evidence of how uh, farmer feedback was being used to influence changes to programming and policy. And this suggests a continued top-down approach to extension. And lastly, there was still limited use of ICTs to provide feedback or solicit more information, even though we do know that there is work being done in that space using those tools. So to strengthen farmer feedback loops, we need to continue to advance research on efficacy of farmer-derived approaches in a participatory way and update content using an iterative process. Looks like it happened again. Well, I'll just keep going. That incorporates new learning and evidence, but also incorporates farmers' perspectives on how they are not using information. And farmer feedback loops could be strengthened by repositioning extension workers as facilitators rather than the experts. And participatory efficacy testing is a way to improve innovation and problem solving skills so that farmers can be more self-reliant. And this could be done in a farmer learning center model. And this model differs from kind of a traditional farmers group um, in that they focus not on the top-down training cascade, but on providing spaces to get together to work on technical information in a hands-on way so, so that farmers can better manage the innovation and learning process themselves. And I'm not sure if, if I'm out of time, but just to highlight some of the main um, takeaways once, a once again is that pesticide use we saw is widespread amongst the respondents, but farmers and other actors need more specific information at certain decision points. And ICTs offer immense opportunity to scale information dissemination, but they're still an important place for farmers' groups and face-to-face -face interactions. And the information flow continues to be top-down with limited evidence of effective feedback mechanisms, and this indicates an opportunity to better leverage farmer learning and innovation. And just lastly, information campaigns should be iterative and reflect diverse contexts and realities of different farmers. And, and with that, I'll end. Thank you. Well, there's my contact information. Thank you, Sarah. That was just terrific. And you really wove it all together for us in terms of how how this all plays out in farmers' fields. Um, I think I, I just want to flag how critical the issue of knowledge and information is. Uh, uh, the, the, and we've heard that all through the morning. And then now to hear how it actually plays out and the importance of wealth, of gender, and of uh, ability to use ICTs, and also the tremendous potential to use them in two-way flows in, in going forward. So with that, we're going to turn to the open discussion now. There's been a really active chat box and many, many questions. Zachary, I, I, I hate to burden you, but can you, can you start us on, on this process, please, uh, to, 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 in, to um, answer these so many great questions that are coming in? Sure, Rob. And yes, to, to second that, the chat box has been quite phenomenal. Everyone has been uh, asking questions, sharing their experiences, sharing their knowledge. It's greatly appreciated. Um, so thank you, everyone. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, for our first question, uh, for Sarah from uh, Bosi Bori Bet, uh, were there challenges amongst farmers on access to ICT on their smartphones? in terms of network coverage and access to continuous data bundles on their mobile phones? If so, how did you overcome this? That's a good question, and I think related to the um, 
the issues with smartphones is actually the, the vast majority of farmers that we interviewed did not actually have ownership of a smartphone. Um, and then we didn't unfortunately get into those details um, related to coverage, but that's a good question. That was, was an oversight. If, you know, there's probably many factors contributing to why farmers don't have read, readily, um, you know, available use. Um, uh, but I, I'll say from my own experience, in most of the places where we conducted the surveys, there was um, coverage uh, with perhaps a, a few exceptions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for another question for, uh, for Asana uh, from Barbara Coloni, uh, no end, sorry, Coloni. Uh, are there available insect resistant management protocols for the use uh, of Bt corn against all armyworms? Or use on Bt corn? Yes. Yes, uh, there are uh, there are protocols for managing the Bt corn uh, to delay the insect resistance, and information on uh, the Bt maize has been uh, made available through our Paul Amivam IPM manual for Africa, uh, and another on follow another on Asia for the Asia is coming up soon. Uh, it's in the process of preparation, uh, but there is a comprehensive chapter on host plant resistance covering both. Uh, native genetic resistance and the BT-based resistance uh, in our 2018 release uh, IPM manual for Africa. Thank you. Um, another question for, uh, question for Dan or Joe um, from Abu Yarma. Uh, in Kipi or the International Center of Insect and Physiology and Ecology, uh, is promoting the push-pull technology to control farm, fall armyworm. How do you compare that approach to uh, GAP, GAP? Joe, shall I take a stab at it and then turn it over to you? Sure, Dan, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> intercropping and push-pull systems clearly have a place in the, in the suite of strategies we have for managing fall armyworm. I think they're particularly relevant, the push-pull system for smallholder farmers, especially those that are raising livestock. It, both the GAP, the, the suite of activities associated with the good agricultural practices, and push-pull systems require major uh, changes in the way we grow maize. And I think that may be something we need to look at. The only cautionary note I would offer is that I, 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 I haven't seen much data about cob damage in push-pull systems. And um, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about whether the push-pull systems will, uh, when you have a situation where you have high egg laying pressure at first tassel uh, and the weather is dry, whether the push-pull systems will protect against cob damage. Joe? Thanks, Dan. Uh, I, I would only add a, a couple of points. Um, the, the, the basic level of GAP, which includes use of fertilizer, good quality seed, and soil pH adjustment should be something all farmers should use. Uh, if you then step up the level of complexity to a process like push-pull or intercropping, as, as Dan said or mentioned, you have to consider the complexity for the farmer. It is harder to implement, which means it's more difficult to scale, and thus is probably not as sustainable. It doesn't mean that it's not usable, but it's something you have to consider uh, when you promote that to a farmer. Most farmers, as uh, Sarah pointed out earlier, tend to like uh, mitigation processes that are single point or, or that are simple. So just, just ensure that when you're implementing those types of programs, you consider those factors uh, in, in your decision process. Over. Great. Uh, Zachary, next question. So next question is for you, Rob. Uh, we've had several questions uh, around the approval of um, GM technology in Africa, and we want uh, to get your comment on it uh, as an example. Maria Sante had the question of how do we get BT maize 
to the research institution, CRI, for further transfer to smallholder farmers in Ghana because the aggregation of the fall armyworm is huge there. Well, thanks, uh, Zachary, and thanks, Mary, for that question. Well, this is um, a, a longstanding issue. Um, I think at the scientific level, there's great interest. For example, we have a research partnership with CIMIT and the African uh, Ag Agricultural Technology Foundation and uh, seven national partners from Ethiopia all the way to uh, Mozambique around uh, uh, both drought tolerant and also Bt maize. And as Dr. Persana said, some of these Bts are actually quite effective against uh, a fall armyworm, and there's others that are even better. We know South Africa is already benefiting from the technology, and that's because they have a functional uh, biosafety regime that's, that's working. Uh, we are working with a number of partner countries, especially through the program and biosafety systems led by uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute. And um, I think, by and large, um, one of our approaches on this, Zachary, has been that we put together our work on technology partnerships and align that with, with uh, science-based regulatory capacity partnerships and, and uh, development. So, Mary, in terms of Ghana, uh, we, have, we do have uh, partnerships at, at the level of the Ghanaian government. Um, ultimately, uh, governments, uh, through their own processes, need to make informed decisions for themselves. Um, what I can say, though, is that the voice of the research community and of the farming communities and the, the evidence that comes from, say, scientific steps like controlled field trials where officials can actually see the impacts. And that was, I think, one of the opportunities when African leaders went to Embrapa in Brazil they could see for themselves the various ways that Brazil was effectively control Brazilian farmers was uh, effective were effectively controlling the pest. So this is a continuing effort. Uh, it needs to be a partnership across this whole community and with our friends in the environment community. Uh, to be, we've heard we know that some of these technologies are hugely environmentally friendly because they would replace a lot of negative impact approaches that are unfortunately still being used despite the efforts of people like Dr. Jepson. Back to you. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, and to follow up on that question, uh, we had a number of questions around GM and BT technology for uh, Prasana. And one of, a couple of those were, is CIMIT planning to integrate MLN resistant traits and fall armyworm resistant traits in the same materials, and was there any report of fall armyworm damage on GM corn? Can we still use it as part of IPM? Okay, there is some background noise, but I will go ahead. Uh, yes, that is a very, very important aspect. It is not just fall armyworm tolerance, but we need to integrate into genetic backgrounds that have other relevant traits for Eastern Africa Definitely, uh, we are integrating fall armyworm tolerance into drought tolerant and MLN resistant genetic backgrounds. Uh, similarly, for Asia, it will be a different set of key traits. For example, uh, post flowering stock rot or fusarium stock rot resistance uh, and other key diseases that are prevalent in Asia. So, based on product profiles, we need to integrate uh, the native genetic resistance to fall armyworm in those appropriate genetic backgrounds. That's uh, an extremely important aspect. Uh, the second question uh, is what, Jackery? Sorry, the second the question, question was, was there any report of fall armyworm damage on GM corn? Can we still use it as part of IPM? Well, yeah, definitely. BT maize is undoubtedly an important part of the IPM toolbox. Uh, however, uh, because of various reasons, uh, for instance, uh, lack of proper implementation of insect resistance management approaches or proper stewardship, uh, there is a possibility that some of these events may be overcome by the insect. Over a period of time, it can take uh, four years, five years, six years, but it did happen uh, in countries like Brazil and uh, other South, South American and North American countries. 
So that possibility is always there, but what is really important here is uh, BT does provide an excellent option uh, as long as it, uh, uh, as it is used very carefully by the smallholders or the farmers. Uh, so uh, let's remember that even in case of BT events, different events may have different levels of resistance. Not all BT events are same in terms of uh, the level of resistance offered. Uh, that's the reason why I am, I am emphasizing the point that it's important to uh, introduce these BT events into, for example, into fall omnivorm tolerant genetic backgrounds coming from native genetic resistance. Then the possibility of uh, sustainability enhances much more. Thank you. Um, this next question is directed to Joe from uh, Ryan uh, Roberge. Uh, is there any evidence that shows that maize grown according to conservation farming methods, including use of both organic and inorganic fertilizer, low-till, and planting with the first usable rains, has demonstrated positive outcomes performance in the context of fall armyworm attacks? Yes, there, there are decades of experience showing that um, use of proper fertilizer, and the source of the fertilizer doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's chemical fertilizer or, or composted fertilizer, as long as the uh, MPK levels are adjusted and the soil pH uh, range is adjusted properly. Now, the key point is to use good seed uh, and also to properly fertilize the crop. In terms of conservation tillage, it's a very good question. Uh, conservation tillage has many benefits all its own. Uh, these discussions, we always focus on fall armyworm, but as many on the line today know, there are a multitude of challenges in raising maize, including other diseases and other insects. And in the African context in particular, water, drought. And so conservation tillage is important for growing a healthy uh, maize crop independent of fall armyworm, uh, just in terms of the conservation of moisture. I think, I hope that answered your question, over. Thank you, Joe. Um, for the next question, we're going to uh, Dan. We had a question from Neil Miller. Uh, doesn't scouting at Cobb development stage contradict Feed the Future guidelines to not spray after flowering? Uh, thank you for that clarifying question. The guidelines remain the same. If all you have is highly toxic insecticide and you don't have access to uh, protective equipment, then the answer is don't spray after first tassel. And that remains, that remains our guidance. However, there are modern pesticides. And if, if a farmer has access to a modern insecticide, which is very low toxicity, uh, Corrigen, for example, uh, Tracer, the LD50 on those materials is greater than 5,000 milligrams per kilogram body weight. So they're, they're less toxic than coffee. Uh, if, you, if you have access to uh, uh, a low toxicity material, and you have access to protective equipment, and the weather is warm and dry, and egg laying pressure is high, and you base your decision on, on, on cob scouting and an action threshold, it may well be worth your effort to apply a material after, after first tassel to save your crop. So both of those are true. Uh, the guidance is, if, if a farmer is, uh, has, no, has only access to highly toxic materials and no access to protective equipment, then the guidance is don't spray after first tassel. But, but the, the other is also true. And so we have, a, we have a scouting protocol for cob scouting and an action threshold. And there are modern materials that can be applied safe, safely. I hope that addresses your question. Over. Joe, you want to say anything? No, I think that was well done, Dan. Thank you. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
So a question for Joe. We've had several questions around host plants uh, for fall armyworm. Uh, as an example, has anyone here observed heavy fall armyworm infestation on sugarcane and wheat? Uh, another um, question from Sanjit Kumar, uh, besides corn and sorghum, what is the next most preferred crop of this polyphagous uh, insect? Yeah, so many people have heard correctly that the fall armyworm will feed on some 80 different host plants, and that's largely uh, a function of the, of the fact that the fall armyworm does not have a diapause capability. So it has to continuously breed uh, and produce larvae and complete its life cycle throughout a season. We've gotten reports of fall armyworm infestations in other crops, sometimes sugarcane, uh, sometimes wheat, sometimes uh, uh, grasses, for example, pasture grasses, Bermuda grass in particular. Um, but in general, I would say I've never heard so far, I haven't heard of any of those that have risen to the level of concern. Um, the particular strain that was introduced in Africa, there's two strains of fall armyworm, a rice strain and a maize strain. And the maize strain predominantly feeds on uh, maize, millet, sorghum. And, and according to the USDA experts that, that you can feel free to contact, it looks like it's predominantly the maize strain, and that's generally where we've seen the damage. Uh, we should appreciate two things. Uh, first, if you have a very heavy moth flights, as Dan was talking about earlier, you will get damage on other crops besides just maize, just simply because the fall armyworm population density is, is so high. But that's not likely to be seen in subsequent years. The focus will probably be on maize. Let me address rice very quickly. Uh, two points. The, the, we do not see, so far, have not seen much damage on rice. Uh, and again, this is probably because it looks like the rice strain was not introduced. Will there be a selection? for a rice strain in Asia uh, because rice is so prevalent? We don't know, but we need to be aware of the fact that that could happen. And then secondly, fall armyworm has arrived uh, outside the Americas once. It's very likely it will arrive again from another source, and, and that other strain could be introduced. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop there. Over. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, Zachary, do you? Sorry, Rob. Take I was going to hand it over to you, uh, but please take it for uh, to wrap up the session. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you, speakers, uh, for just terrific uh, uh, presentations, followed by a great uh, question and answer session. Um, I think, you know, with this whole discussion has really been about the evolution of this pest in. Africa and sub and Asia, and how we're uh, learning. We at first were really learning by virtue of what we knew in the Americas, but now it's really about learning from what's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa, in in Asia, and in these new environments for the pest. Um, so I think it's been wonderful to have uh, a range of of perspectives in terms of how knowledge, how technologies and practices fit together. Uh, obviously, this is a complex pest. It's, it has various susceptibilities. And um, there's, I don't think there's a silver bullet we're talking about. It's a range of things. And then compounding that, a couple of uh, observations. One is the knowledge content of so much of what we heard about today, particularly the control uh, in the field, uh, the, the presentations from from Paul, from Dan, from Sarah, uh, and, and from Joe, really, uh, uh, about um, how we manage this pest and the role of information tools, telephones, radio, uh, other kinds of uh, means of getting good information to farmers uh, at all levels and then trying to tailor that information to the economic opportunities. Uh, uh, that they have, their ability to pay, for example. 
Uh, the other uh, piece I think that was really very important is the policy piece. Uh, this has got to do with just getting new varieties or hybrids out of maize uh, or BT accessibility for farmers um, and, and um, or the pesticides. Getting those safer, newer chemistries, making them available quickly and having regulatory systems that function where you have reciprocity, for example, across a region. All of that can be an uh, important uh, contributor as well. Um, so, so this is really, um, we ha we're looking forward now. Uh, we're in a context where COVID and locusts are, are also grabbing a lot of attention. And yet this very compelling situation with fall army where meads are continued efforts. We need information from all of you. We need the community to be sharing experiences about impacts, what's working, what's not working, and the degree of damage, because all of that helps those of us trying to support your work uh, do a better job. Finally, I want to just thank Regina Eddy and Siobhan Whiten uh, and Zachary and our KDL team, uh, Adam Ahmed and others, uh, for their tremendous support in putting today's pre uh, presentation together, all the work that's gone into this. I think it paid off beautifully, team, and I'm really grateful to have a, had an opportunity to be with you all. Thank you all very much. This will be recorded. And I think other materials, the, the presentations, et cetera, will be made available in about a week or so. Thanks, everyone. Zachary, have I left anything out? Nope, that's it, Rob. Um, if you'd registered for the event, uh, we will be sending you an email with uh, links to all the resources that uh, Rob mentioned. Uh, there will be a transcript of the uh, recording as well as a transcript of the chat box. I know it has been moving rapidly. People have been sharing quite extensively on their experiences, asking questions and the like. We will have a separate document with all of that chat box there as well for you to access. Um, we will also try to get to all of the questions that were unanswered as best as possible um, as part of that transcript. And again, thank you and appreciate your participation. Thank you for your sharing. And we look forward to your um, future participation in uh, webinars uh, in the future. Uh, thank you again. Have an excellent day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.